Okay, we'll uh, we'll get started, and uh, inshallah, Abu Hamza will uh, will join us uh, shortly. Um, okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon to you all. Firstly, I'd like to thank God the Almighty for bringing us here together and safely from our uh, own homes, hopefully. Um, and I'd also I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the land that we uh, congregate on, um, and the areas we congregate on from our own homes as we uh, zoom in on this uh, panel. Um, let me begin firstly by saying how grateful I am to be able to host a panel session with such very well respected brothers and sisters who are community leaders, ambassadors, and role models. Most of them don't need an introduction. Um, but for the interest of others, I'll, I'll give a short one. Um, uh, our special guest tonight, who's joined us, who uh, most of this panel is uh, Lebanese for the community out there, but he is not, I'm, I'm, I'm sure about that. Um, but Jerome Weimar, the Commander COVID Response uh, of Victoria, thank you for joining this panel. We really appreciate it. Um, we have Dr. Haloum Rafihi, uh, the Senior Research Fellow uh, at the Walter and Eliza Hall um, Institute of Medical Research, uh, probably the uh, only qualified uh, doctor here among the panelists and everyone. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Haloum. Um, we have Tariq Koda, so the president of the Islamic Society of Victoria, better known as Preston Mosque, um, probably uh, actually one of the first large scale mosques in Victoria with uh, a lot of Lebanese uh, followers there. Um, we have uh, Ahmed Fahua Ayo, who's uh, an executive, managing director of Latitude um, and philanthropist. We have uh, the just retired uh, Basha Huli, um, former Richmond football player, who knows, maybe next year again or somewhere else, based on the rumors we're reading in the newspaper, um, and founder of uh, the Basha Huli Foundation. Um, we've got uh, Sheikh. Uh, Abu Hamza, hopefully he's having a few technical difficulties um, that uh, he will join us shortly, but he's an imam from uh, my center and founder of my center. We have uh, Holto Lina, who's an ICV hospital chaplain, very well known within the community for the aunties, the sisters, um, generally always there, very active on uh, social media. Um, and our final guest, uh, we have Mohammed Mohtadi, who's the uh, director and founder of Specialized Fire and probably um, of all the large organizations in essential services, also uh, a big recruiter of um, young uh, Lebanese Muslims uh, from the community as well. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Now, before I get started, I want to make something uh, very clear. Tonight was an initiative brought about by the community leaders. It's not a government funded initiative. None of us are paid by the government. We are all purely here in our own capacities as community leaders, mentors, and ambassadors. And we've brought Jerome. I'm not sure how hard they're gonna go on him, but the focus is on our way of out of lockdown and what the future looks like and what's the current situation um, at the moment. So uh, without further ado, um, and wasting time, I am going to pass the Zoom unmute button to Jerome to give us a, a bit of background and feedback of exactly what's happening at the moment. We heard on the press there is a uh, rise in um, issues coming out of the West and the North within the community. So we thought it was a good opportunity to have you to uh, tell us a little bit about it. Over to you, Jerome. Right. Um, Salam alaikum, everybody. Mustafa, thank you so much. I can also just pay respects to uh, everybody and my thanks to everybody for being here tonight and for inviting me into, into your meeting. Uh, and also just a, a, a big ticket of respect and thanks to the other speakers. Uh, it's a real, a real honor to be with you uh, today. Um, so let me just explain a bit about you know, why, why we're so concerned about COVID in the community at this point. Um, just over two weeks ago, two and a bit weeks ago, um, we had no cases of COVID in the community that we were aware of. We were COVID free and before the lockdown started and we could live an almost normal life. We could even see Richmond uh, play with, with very small crowds. Um, we're now in a space of two and a half weeks. We have over 500 cases in the community. 
particularly a lot of those cases in the inner west and in the northern suburbs, but also in places like Shepparton and, and all across other parts of our city. 45 new cases today. Um, and that's kind of scary enough. But what, what it also means is we have 36 uh, people in hospital today. We have nine people in intensive care and seven, o's, seven of those people are breathing on a machine. Uh, that's, that's how serious and how quickly this has happened. Two weeks ago, all those people were living at home normally, doing all the things we do every day. Um, and what's really worrying us is this outbreak. And we've seen outbreaks before, but this one is really hitting our youngest people. So 89 of the 500 odd people are between the ages of 20 and 29. Uh, it's pretty young by my standards, uh, and that's even younger than Basha. Um, 101 people are between the ages of 10 and 19. There are teenagers, are, are, are high school students, and 114 are the little kids under the age of 10. Um, that is a really scary number when you think of how young these kids are that are now getting COVID and passing it amongst themselves and into their families. Um, Two weeks ago, when two and a bit weeks ago, when we found the first case, um, it was actually a, a teacher at Altaqua um, College. Um, and Altaqua and the school communities at, at ICOM, at Mount Alexander, at, at Heathdale Christian College have done the most amazing job over the last two or three weeks in supporting their communities and their school community to isolate and to stop COVID in its tracks. They have done the most fantastic job. And a huge respect to um, to, to Mahatalak and others in, in the school movement who have been so good at keeping, at working with their school communities to get people tested, to support them to isolate and the food and welfare and everything they've done. And as a result, we've seen a really good control over that first wave of COVID. And I thought, you know, even a week ago, I thought, I think we've got this, I think we've got this under control. But what's happened since then, and it's really in the last week, 10 days, is we've seen more and more cases grinding around, particularly in, in suburbs like Newport, like Altona, down in Wyndham, uh, coming up also into the northern suburbs of families getting the virus into their, into their midst. And we have, in particular, we have around at least 60, uh, 60 people in the, in, in the Lebanese Australian community, men, women, and children who are COVID positive now. And we're seeing a worrying pattern of COVID getting through into our most, into our social contacts, into our work contacts, and into our family contacts across the Lebanese and Australian community in particular. And through exposures like Newport Footy Club, um, for, through some of the exposure sites we've seen in Altona North and in Wyndham, we're seeing it move pretty quickly. And today I've seen a number of new cases in the northern suburb, also in, in, uh, in, in larger Lebanese Australian communities. And the way the virus works and what we're seeing is that it, the virus essentially, as soon as you have one infected person, and we don't, and, and a lot of the people who are positive have no symptoms. So they don't know they've got it. They look just like Mustafa looks, look, look like I look, they're, we're, we're, we're going about our business every day. But what's happening is they're taking it into their school environment when the schools are open. They're taking it into their workplaces and they're spreading it in their work colleagues in a number of places that, that where we've had it spread at work. People are taking it home into their, into their, into their street and into their house and into their family. And then it's spreading quickly and then people get ill and become symptomatic and then we find a really big problem. And the problem is as soon as a virus is in your home, it affects the people, it's gonna infect the people you live with and the people you love the most. Um, so we really need to work together because the virus, you know, and, and for those of us, you know, particularly for the men amongst us, for the younger men amongst us, I know we're pretty confident and I know we're pretty, we pretty rate our health pretty well although a lot of the people in intensive care are younger people in their 20s and 30s, um, it also gets into the rest of our family. And once you have it, you can't stop spreading it. There's nothing you can do about that. So what's been really encouraging though in the last few days is we've, we've, we're really keen to stop this now. And we're really keen to get as many people tested as possible. Uh, so if, you're, if you've been to the exposure site at the places that are listed on our website, are familiar to you, we want you to get tested. If you've got any symptoms or there's somebody in your house has got symptoms, we want you to get tested. And we've seen a lot, a big increase over the last few days of more of our Lebanese Australian community coming forward to get tested. That is a fantastic result because it allows us to build a better picture and to work out who's got it and who hasn't. The other thing that's been really important to us is that, you know, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, we saw a lot of people 
um, getting tested really late. So they'd come and they're already they've been ill for a week or ten days, and then they're getting it, and then they're getting tested and they turn positive, and their entire family is positive. Um, we're now seeing the last few days people getting tested earlier, which is really good news. So you know it used to be about three days on average, now it's about one and a half days on average. So people are getting on with it quicker, which I'm really grateful for. Now I know. I know the I know we're all fed up with the COVID thing, and we're fed up with seeing the premier on the TV. You're fed up with seeing me and Brett Sutton on the TV. Uh, we all want to do something else. We want to listen to something else. I absolutely get that. Um, and the way out of this is we've just got to hang tight together for a couple of weeks. Because if we can hang tight together, get ourselves tested, stay home as much as possible, uh, and do little things like wearing masks and stuff, we can stop it in its tracks now, and we can ease off those restrictions again. The really scary thing for me is if we just keep going like this, we're always going to be chasing our tail and we'll never quite get out of the lockdown. And I just don't want to do that. I might talk about vaccinations a bit later, Mustafa, but let me maybe stop there because I'd love to hear from the other speakers. And, and again, thank you so much for, for inviting me into your discussion. Thanks, Jerome. Um, yes, your, uh, your a few minutes there did uh, trigger quite a bit of questions that have come in. And um, for those that are using the Q&A, sending the questions, I am receiving them. Um, I might save them to the end because some of our speakers might cover it. And I know that, you know, it's all about the roadmap and getting out and we've got a few questions directed to Jerome. But what I might do, a lot of the leaders here tonight get a lot of feedback from their community themselves and want to send that message about, you know, getting tested. You know, we saw the case out of, you know, um, unfortunately out of the childcare um, that happened where a person that had no symptoms um, that had come in and uh, unfortunately uh, it, it passed around. So we'll, we'll get into that a bit more, but I'm gonna go to Atari Koda. You, you, you're the president of, you know, the first large scale mosque in Victoria, um, predominantly um, Lebanese, uh, a lot of young men um, that come through the doors uh, in and out when it was open. Um, you've been very active on social media. There was one post that's been shared a number of times and I've seen gone right through the community and that was where you linked the Islamic principles behind um, the DHHS guidelines. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why is it an Islamic obligation upon us um, to, to follow these guidelines? Yes, that is correct, uh, Mustafa. Firstly, uh, thank, thank you all the panel for tonight, um, you know, for you guys making your time uh, to be on this. Um, I think it's very, very important that we reach out to our, our community and to let them know. Um, look, uh, the Prophet's advice on this, and he's the best of it, he's the best of teachers, and we always turn back to him for everything that we do. Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, spoke about quarantine. He spoke about social distancing. He spoke about face masks. He spoke about washing hands, traveling, home quarantine. So all this is part of our, our religion. It's part of Islam, you know, I mean, um, social distancing, for example, there, there's contagious diseases that we should be kept away. And, and from those who are healthy, um, face mask, you know, while sneezing, cover your face, you know, cover your, with your hand or with your garment. You know, so, so these are all, all Islamic uh, teachings of our Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, Mustafa. Um, and, you know, look, what I've noticed is a lot of things also that um, we, we, we really need a little bit more of educating our community a little bit more um, because, because there's a little bit of confusion happening. Um, we need to know as leaders because, they, they, you know, there's a lot of questions that, that I get asked, you know, about this. And all we do, we, I turn back to the prophet, peace be upon him, and I, I, you know, I give him, I give them his advice. So, you know, in, in the sense of even home quarantine, you know, the, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, you know, the patient should remain at home with patience, you know, and inshallah, Allah Azza wa will reward him. You know, so you don't spread, so you don't spread the the, the virus around. You know, even even you know, travel. Do not enter a land where the plague, you know, has broken out. Don't leave where, you know, till it's it's settled. So these are all teachings of our Prophet, peace be upon him. At the end of the day, he's the best of our of teachers. And, uh, you know, and that's what we're educating our community about and our people about. Thank you, Brother Tarek. Uh, appreciate it. And, um, you know, that advice is directly in line in the way you've linked Hadith and 
the Quranic text around social distancing, isolating. If there's a pandemic um, or a virus being spread, do not leave, stay in your own home so you don't spread it or catch it, um, you know, fits within today. Um, I'm going to go around to each of the panellists. Um, questions are coming in in droves, so um, hopefully they'll, they'll get covered. If not, I will ask the question, so be rest assured. Jerome, they're all pointed to you, mate, but uh, we'll get there shortly. Um, I'm going to go on to our, our doctor, our medical expert from the community, doesn't work for DHS. I think Jerome didn't even know Dr. Halum until this panel anyway. Um, so Dr. Halum, uh, please, can you give us from a medical feedback, a bit about this virus and more importantly, the difference with this Delta virus. You know, what, what is going on for us people at home that aren't experts um, and fields? Can you explain it in English for us? Yep, thanks, uh, Mustafa. So what we know about the Delta variant mm -hmm. is that it's a highly contagious version um, of the coronavirus. So where it arose is that we know that viruses have a very high mutation rate. And what that means is that they're always changing. Sometimes those changes to the virus can give it an advantage. So with Delta, that made it more infectious. And as a result of that increased infect infection rate, um, it's become the dominant variant of coronavirus. And as we've seen, it's spread across the world and taken over the other variants. Um, so fortunately, th there is some good news. So the evidence so far shows that the Delta variant, even though it's more contagious, it doesn't actually cause worse disease. So your likelihood of getting sick from the Delta variant is the same as the original coronavirus, which is still quite high. Um, but unfortunately, your likelihood of infecting other people increases. So you need to be really conscious of how you being infected may potentially impact the lives of other people. Um, and I just wanted to also say that there has been some thought in the community that perhaps vaccinations aren't as effective with the Delta a variant of the virus, and that's just not true. Both the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccines are very effective uh, against the Delta variant of the coronavirus. And it reduces, um, if, if you have both doses of the vaccine, it, induce, it reduces the likelihood that you will become infected. And if you do become infected, it then reduces your likelihood of serious disease and hospitalization by 90%. And we have evidence for this in Sydney today. We know that the vast, vast majority of people in Sydney who are in hospital have not received the, um, the vaccine, not even uh, a single dose. And then you have some people who have received uh, one dose and then much less people who have received both doses um, of the vaccine. Um, and I actually just had a question for Jerome, if that's okay. Um, given the amazing response we saw at, at Takwa College with the vaccination, I was wondering if you're thinking of setting up some pop-up vaccination sites within the communities at schools or childcare centres to encourage vaccination uptake. Can I just, um, just while I got you there, before you jump in, because that hits one of the Q&A and we could knock it off. Yep. Um, one of the questions that come in is, can we set up vaccination sites across mosques for communities? So yeah, maybe add that within your answer. I will do. Uh, hello, and thank you so much. That was that was great, and thank you so much for your uh, for, for your advice earlier. Um, look, I think we we had a really we did a pop up site vaccination at our Taiko College a couple of weeks ago, which is amazingly successful. I think 1,200, 1,300 people got vaccinated in the school community. Um, we, we're absolutely looking at doing more pop up vaccination hubs, probably in a couple of months' time. Mainly because we've today, literally today, we've opened up vaccination through our state clinics and through our GPs. Um, to anybody who is 16 and over. So suddenly we've got a huge amount of demand of everybody's wanting to get vaccinated, which is brilliant. Um, so I think we'll we'll kind of run through that over the next next few weeks when it starts to slow down a bit, then we'll start to go back out into our community organizations, mosques, et cetera, to uh, to to help those people get vaccinated who don't who who haven't come forward yet. But uh, I would love everybody to think to to start thinking about booking a vaccine appointment. If you haven't done it yet, please do it. It's um it's the only way out of this thing. Thanks, Jerome. While we're at it, I had another question. Maybe you can uh, answer that if you can. And basically, it was saying initially there was a 12 week suggested period between the first dose and second dose. And it's yeah. now a two week period. What's changed? And is this. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's quite correct. And to be honest, Haloom is the only clinical person on this panel, not me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a humble logistics organizer. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the answer I'm aware of. So the, the Pfizer interval, the, the, and we're offering Pfizer now to everybody who is between the ages of 16 and 59. So the vast majority of us, um, certainly, certainly you and I, Mustafa. 
um, uh, can can now get Pfizer if they've not yet been vaccinated. Um, and the interval between those doses is between three and six weeks. And we've made it a bit longer, six weeks, so that we can get more people through their first doses. And we've got more vaccine arriving in September, October. So it helps us to get more people through. Um, with, with AstraZeneca, we've reduced it from, it was originally 12 weeks. We've pushed it down, it was 14 weeks. I think we've pushed it down to about 10 or 12 weeks now. Um, again, to help, because we have a lot of AstraZeneca supply, it's the opposite problem to Pfizer, to speed up people's journey, that second dose period process for people. So there's various debates about it, but that's why we've done it. But it doesn't really matter which vaccine you get. We just need to get it done. Thanks, Jerome. Uh, appreciate it. Dr. Holm, is there anything you wanted to add to, to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that with the vaccines, there is no single period between the doses that you, have to, you must get the vaccine in that time frame. You know, usually there's a range um, of, you know, uh, a couple of weeks or where the vaccine will be effective. And, you know, when you have community reasons for maybe extending that a little bit, you, that, you know, that's justified based on uh, the data that we have of the efficacy of the vaccines. Thank you. And Jerome, speaking of it being open, as soon as I turned 40, I booked my, uh, my, my Pfizer. I had my first, I had my dose today. And uh, I was just telling some friends, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. I tried the iPad thing. It didn't magnify on my arm. Um, I didn't get 5G on my phone. Uh, I was a bit disappointed. <laughs> I even tried to QR scan, you know, but nothing popped up. So, um, so much conspiracy <laughs> theories out there. I thought I'd try it myself and none of them were correct. Yeah. Uh, well, I look up. Please. Go, Mustafa. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jerome. No, no, I look, I look exactly, and, and I think, like, I think, I think actually, um, Dr. Rafa is probably better, better equipped to speak to it than I am. But again, there's been so much work done, and please, you know, read, read whatever website you want to go to. Um, the vaccines are being used around the world. They're being used in in, in every country of the world now. You know, mil literally hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated. We know they're safe. We know they work, and they're stopping people from dying. If you look in Sydney now, Sydney have got more cases than we've ever had in in Melbourne, even you know, last year. More more cases than we've ever had. But there are very few people who are who are in hospital or dying by comparison to what we lived through last year, because the older generation has largely been vaccinated in Sydney. So it's keeping it's keeping older people out of hospital in Sydney, which is a really the only good news. Uh, and and we need to we need to now extend that to all the younger people, you know, all of us under forty um, now. Thanks, Jerome. All right, I'm going to keep it uh, keep it going. We've got a, uh, other leaders with uh, other issues that uh, they'll talk about. I'm going to go on to Mohammed Muhtadi. I can see he's just there staring at me, ready to go. Mohammed, um, you know, you run a business in essential services, which is fire services. You employ a lot of young um, Lebanese um, uh, as, as your employees. You've experienced uh, firsthand from very close friends of people um, that are currently actually going through um, the, the COVID-19 uh, symptoms. Um, you've been very pro on the vaccination as well. Please tell us a little bit about your story and why you think it's important um, and, and what you've experienced firsthand from your close friend. Assalamu alaikum guys. Thanks, uh, thanks Mustafa firstly for, for arranging such a powerful, um, powerful panel. It's, um, it's great to see everyone sort of jumping on board with this. Um, from from my perspective, we, as you said, we we uh, we're an essential services business, so that means we go everywhere, wherever there's people, we, we're there. Uh, we protect life, we protect buildings, we protect um, facilities. So for for us and, and our workforce, it's it's very critical that you know we're safe, we're COVID safe, and we're and we're vaccinated. So um, it's really important. Uh, that as a as a as a you know as a director of a business that our people are safe, but also that we we understand the roadmap out of this. Um, from, from one perspective, I've got to I've got to make sure that the uh, the, business, the service that we're providing is a safe service. But we're going to have a service to be able to keep delivering. If we're not out of this, my business won't be around. So we really got to get around the idea of of uh, getting vaccinated so we can continue operating our business. Um, recently, you touched on on a friend of ours who. Um, who works in my industry? He he was uh, an employee. Um, he's got a daughter who works in in uh, aged care. Twenty two year old, double vaccinated. Um, she came home with COVID, not realizing. Um, within three days, the father was in intensive care for thirteen days. The mother was in intensive care for nine days, and before they got to hospital, and as a Lebanese community, and I'm sure it happens in many other communities. 
the first thing that happens is mum and dad ring up and say, oh my God, my children are sick. I'm going to come and cook for you. So mum and mum and dad rush into the house. They start looking after the sick children and the grandchildren. And next thing you know, the father, the wife, the grandmother, the grandfather, the children, they're all in intensive care. They've been, um, you know, men in suits have come and taken them across to quarantine and, and to, you know, special ICU units. That's nothing, that's something that nobody wants to experience. And from what, uh, um, I won't mention his name, but from what he was explaining to me, that was the hardest part, being separated from his family, feeling helpless. I mean, there's nothing more helpless than lying in, in a hospital bed, knowing that your family's sick as well, not just yourself, but your family's sick and you can't do anything to help them. And had you have been vaccinated, his daughter, mind you, going back to the story, his daughter, who's 22 years old, had minor symptoms, three days and she was fine, done. Um, no hospitalization, a bit of a flu. However, the, the rest of the family, you know, it was touch and go there for a while. So for us, as, as, um, as, as you said, as, a, as, an, as an employer, uh, touching a lot of different businesses and, and places, it's really critical that we all get vaccinated so we can continue on with our work. We've got a moral obligation um, to our clients and to our community to make sure that the people that are out there in the community are vaccinated. So, and then from my perspective, I want, you know, I want my kids to go back to school. I want, I want my mum to be able to come and visit me safely and cook for me. <laughs> I want my wife and, and her family to come and visit. So these things are important to us. And if that's the roadmap, roadmap out, then, you know, that's what we have to do. And I suppose if we can touch on that roadmap out later on, Steph, with, with Jerome about what it's going to take to get those to get those numbers what what is that magical number and how do we get that back into to normal that'd be great thanks Mohammed. it's uh you know we're seeing this common especially our brothers and sisters out of sydney and uh, the severity we just saw in channel nine you know they had just four cases and um you know may Allah uh, protect them and help them to to get through this and as well as our um, everyone that's suffering, um, you know, across the world, let alone uh, in Victoria. Um, I'm going to go to Jerome and hang on on the because there's so many uh, sort of questions coming in, but a lot of it is linked to this roadmap. So we've heard the Prime Minister come out and say, we're going to get to 80%, we're going to get to 80%, no more lockdowns at 80%. Um, you know, the premiers need to listen, blah, 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 blah. Can you shed some light on this 80% vaccination rate? Um, we had another question, so maybe you can answer all these in one. Another question was, okay, you know, with the schools in uh, other countries, what they've done is they've separated classrooms in terms of days. So if there is an outbreak, not everyone's impacted at all. Have all these been considered? Yep. Uh, gr great questions. And Mohammed also, I think, made, made a really good point, and, and I, I, I thank him for making it. Um, so so the, the really important, the, the, urge, the immediate roadmap is that, if we can get the, you know, today we saw 45 cases, um, 30 of those were out in the community. It's way too many. If we can get today's cases and tomorrow's cases and the cases in the in the next week or two back down to only cases who are in quarantine, who are in isolation, then we can start to reduce those lockdown things now. And we've done that before. We did that in, we did it in for six months of this year, between January and, and well, November and, and, and May, we had that we didn't have lockdown we had restrictions but far fewer restrictions and we all remember what what that felt like um we we took lockdown away two weeks ago three weeks ago we had to put it back in again so if we can get the immediate cases back down to only cases in safely in quarantine safely at home isolating then we can take those worst restrictions away immediately um vaccination helps us with the long term because if we can get that the, all the medical experts say if eight out of 10 of us have been doubly vaccinated, so 16 year olds and above, eight out of 10 of us doubly vaccinated, then when you see, you know, when COVID comes back into the community, it essentially, it doesn't run out of control in the way that we're seeing all around the world and the way that, you know, the, the things that are happening in Sydney at the moment, it doesn't accelerate because there are far fewer people who are vulnerable to the infection and there is a far lower level of transmission because although people who are vaccinated can transmit, they transmit, that they are less likely to transmit. They have a lower viral load, which means they are less likely to transmit. So the whole thing is just suppressed. It's all damped down. So that's why the 80% vaccination is important because then it means you don't get these massive out of control outbreaks whereby thousands get infected and hundreds end up in hospital and tens of people die. That's the change we want with vaccination. So we're now, you know, today we said everybody over 16 can get vaccinated. You know, our systems are being smashed, which is great. 
Um, we think we can vaccinate all adult Victorians 16 and over, doubly vaccinated, certainly by the end of the year, end of November, December time, if we all get on with it. We'll have enough vaccine finally to do that. And that, that stops us having all those lockdowns. And yeah, we'll still have COVID in the community, but it'll be impacting a smaller number of people and we can manage it, we think, more in a much more in a localised way. In terms of the schools, I mean, closing the schools is the worst thing you can do. I mean, it's, it's a really, really awful thing to do. I've got older children at home, um, but in terms of their development, in terms of their social experience and all the things we know about and, and having the kids at home is just horrific. Um, so we all want to get the schools back. The risk we're seeing you know, in this outbreak with, with the schools, you know, the, the, like the outbreaks at Altaqua, we had the outbreaks last year at, at Epic. Uh, we, see, we see schools now with Delta being really very high rates of transmission between children. So uh, if we can get rid of the, the cases in the community now, we've got strong border controls here in Australia and in Victoria. We can get the schools back open again. We might have some smaller classes. We might do some things differently, but we can do that you know, much sooner than the end of the year if we get rid of these community cases, which is why I really want everybody to double down and say, if we can stop the transmission that's happening now in the way we've done it before, then we can start to open up a bit and we can get our kids back into school at least. So, Jerome, I've got two things out of that one, right? Yeah. First one is right now to get rid of lockdown, if yeah. we all just get tested, we isolate, yeah. that means you have yeah. no transmission of people out there that have COVID and don't know they have it. That's it. We can get out of this lockdown. The second thing That's I've right. got out of you, so everyone get tested, isolate yeah. if you're in those hotspots and those suburbs, which are yeah. now spreading quite like wildfire, I guess, around the west and the north at the moment. The second piece yeah. of advice you're saying is if we get to 80%, which most likely looks like towards November, December, um, this should exactly. end pretty much these lockdowns. That's right. That's right. And absolutely right, Mustafa. And if you want to see, but they look at the difference we're making at the, yeah, all of us are making every on the call, all of our friends in the community, we're not seeing it out of control in the Western and Northern suburbs, but we're still seeing transmission. Now, I want to stop that transmission that so get tested, isolate. Let's just knuckle down for a few weeks and we can get rid of this thing now and we can open up a bit and then we can get vaccinated and then open up properly at the end of the year. Okay, I'm going to continue to our panelists. We've got a, a few more um, to go. Uh, welcome, Abu Hamza. So I know you had a bit of technical difficulties, but I know you've been on a, with us for a little while. We just all got carried away talking. So um, we'll uh, we'll come to you, to you shortly. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Ahmed. Normally I'll, I'll go to Khultulim, but I'm going to jump in with Ahmed. Ahmed normally gives... Um, you know, especially within the family and the, the community and a lot of young, some really good advice and sort of sums up situations quite well. From an executive at that corporate level, for LAMP, you know, you're involved in different philanthropy. What advice now from everything you've heard from the doctor, from Jerome, can you give the community right now? You're born in Lebanon. I know you're passionate within the Lebanese community. What, what, what's your piece of advice? Thanks, Mustafa. Uh, look, thanks very much for everybody else and, um, and, 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 and the sage advice that they've given. Look, it's very clear and unequivocal, uh, the data, the information, but I actually, um, I want to stick up for the community on one regards, which is, I don't think there's very much hesitancy to get vaccinated. I don't think that's the problem. I think... The surveys show very clearly nine out of 10 people in this country would get vaccinated as soon as they possibly can. So I think, um, I think the first problem that we have has been the poor level of coordination of supply to the people who want to get vaccinated. And if we'd been smart, uh, we started with the older people, we should have jumped straight to the kids and let them get on with school. And so that's my criticism. My criticism is, is we've been poor in administering and effectively managing um, that side of it. Now that said, uh, like everything in life, um, it's, you know, if there's smoke, there's fire. Um, at the same time, our community um, is poor at managing um, to deal with lockdowns or even social distancing or protecting 
our parents and our loved ones and our friends. We just find it really, really difficult to do. And people of Mediterranean background, Greek, Italian, Lebanese, Maltese, whatever it may be, we are social people and we find it really, really hard to isolate. Uh, some people like you, Mustafa, who actually love lockdown because you just like to be left alone at home, you, you, you enjoy it. But for the rest of us, we find this really difficult to do, really, really hard to do. And the problem is this, right? Until we do this, right, until we get it right, we are in deep trouble. We are, business is going to stop. Um, the government doesn't have endless money. Right now, they're printing a bit of it and they're pumping as much as they can. But if we don't get this under control, this thing is going to be very, very costly to people's livelihoods, to their mental health, to their financial health, and to a lot of other things. Now, vaccination is going to happen. But if you don't want to wait till the end of November, and I don't, nobody else does on this panel wants to wait till the end of November. If you want to get back to work, you want to get back to enjoying life, if you want to get back to traveling, if you want to get back to seeing friends, you want to get back to the gyms, you want to get back to being able to go to restaurants, any of these things, there's only one way. It's not even vaccination because vaccination is going to take us through till November. It's a long, long way. The only way is to observe social distancing, put on your masks, get tested and to go as quickly as possible into isolation the moment uh, you get a chance to do so. And I, I can tell you that the uh, majority of people do follow that, but it actually only takes a minority to not, and we're all stuffed, which is what's happened right now. It's a very small bunch of people. So the most people who are listening to this call, they're not the problem. The majority of Victorians are not the problem. It's this tiny 1%, when they don't do it, it actually stuffs the other 99%. And I can tell you right now, anybody who thinks it's not my problem, they're dreaming. Because if you see somebody not observing these rules, and like we do either at work or at home, if you don't follow the rules, you've got to call it out. You've got to say, hey, mate, come on. That's not good enough. Or, you know, or get, get one of these Lebanese movements and say, hello, Fergie. And so the quicker we get around to holding people to account, the better off we're going to be and calling them out because those small minority are actually affecting all of us and our livelihoods, our family, our friends and our loved ones. So the, so the real message I'm sending is we need to do our bit. The government needs to do their bit, which is to get the bloody supply in place as quickly as possible. Yes, they're doing that now, but they've really stuffed it for the last six months, but that doesn't matter because we've also stuffed it and we need to do our bit. Thanks, Ahmed. Jerome, tell us about this supply issue and knock off a few questions, yep. which is about can we get vaccinations around mosques and community hubs and where people yep. can't uh, get access to it? Yeah, uh, can, I, can I just say, I thought, Ahmed, I thought that was a, that was a very thoughtful and, and a very honest um, view and, and, and I thank you for saying it. Um, and I think particularly, it only takes a very small minority of people to go to coffee shops, to visit their family when in another house, when, when, when really they shouldn't, because that's how the virus jumps around. And we've got so many examples of people who thought they were just doing, I just wanted to go and do this, and I didn't mean to do it, but I did it, and the virus has jumped with them. It, it, it's such a small thing that this virus can, can jump around with. Uh, look, in terms of the vaccine, look, I agree. Um, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to point fingers about who orders a vaccine or the rest of it. You guys can can can, can look that up. But um, look, the vaccines are here late. We are six months, five months behind the rest of the world in in getting vaccines into Australia. Um, that's that's a and it's really disappointing when you looked at how hard we've all worked as an Australian community over a year and a half to to keep COVID pretty much out of the country uh, and then to 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 let it drop. You know, to be so late in the vaccines, but. Yeah, and, I, and I'm genuinely sorry for that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, it's a very, very sad state of affairs. Um, the, the only positive is that we now, the vaccine is here now. So, you know, right now I've got, you know, we, we, we are doing 30, 40,000, 30,000 vaccinations a day now just at the state clinics. 
We've got 55 different places to get vaccinated in the state clinics. We've got a thousand GPs in Victoria that have got access to the vaccine. Um, and there are literally you know, hundreds of thousands of vaccines available every single week. So, so it is now starting to happen at last. It's taken a bloody long time, but it is happening now. And if you've been vaccinated already, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and if you haven't yet, now's the time to, to get on board and, and to get it done, because that's the only way out of this thing. Thanks, Jerome. Um, I'm uh, going to touch on a few topics that have come up, but firstly, Ahmed raised a good point. I'm going to go to uh, Fotolina. Um, you know, we mentioned about this stigma within sort of the Lebanese culture, and you look at a lot after a lot of mums and aunties where I'm going to pull you by the ear. I don't care if there's AIDS spreading through the world. I have to see you. And, you know, how, how do we deal with this cultural element? How have you been dealing with seeing it in the community? Uh, Brother Ahmed Paul has uh, covered most of the things that I wanted to talk about, but uh, uh, I'm going to take it to another uh, point. Uh, my um, Facebook uh, nephew uh, has posted something very important, and um, I'd like to share that current story that uh, can give a message. He said... Uh, Yesterday, my dad is in ICU right now. His kidneys are failing. Let me just say this to all the lockdown skeptics. If it wasn't for these restrictions, my dad may not have had the chance to get an ICU bed. There may have been countless elderly and vulnerable with COVID in the ICU. And then where would he be? So he's asking for dua and, you know, some sense. Basically, is just directing, you know, the conversation towards another level because we need to think of other people who are really in need for an ICU bed and without the restrictions that we are you know um, you know abiding which we should be abiding if we have if we have infection to be isolated stick to the rules of isolation if not stick to the rules of lockdown and with that we can uh, protect our vulnerable in our community our jiddos our taitas you know, other nephews and nieces, the young ones. So just uh, appealing to everyone to stick to the rules, stick to the rules and together, let's let's get out of this. There's, there must be a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's my question to Jerome. Um, living with Corona, that's the new, uh, you know, uh, caption that's coming around. You know, how does it look like, you know? If you can uh, let me yeah. know what's what's the plan. Yeah. Thank you. Th th thank thank you, Lena. Um, look, I think the, the 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 plan is we we can only live with Corona when the vast majority of us have been vaccinated because we can see and your and your story is so powerful. Um, the, the example you gave of the very real pressure on intensive care beds in our hospitals, and we're so so worried about that. We can see, you know, Sydney is doing a fantastic job in trying to hold it down. We've seen in other parts of the world where it's been much worse. Um, and it's for everybody who ever needs a health service that we have to protect that we have to stop the beds from overflowing with, with, with COVID patients. I think what it looks like at you know, next year is that we're all vaccinated or the 80%, eight out of 10 of us are vaccinated and hopefully more. Um, we will still see COVID around, but those, who, those of us who are vaccinated will not suffer significant medical complications uh, you know, we might not feel great but we won't feel significant medical complications and we have other ways of protecting a small minority who are not yet vaccinated and it allows us to go back into normal things it probably means and one of the questions and i think certainly in in, in the occupied territories they're doing do they're doing booster doses now um so they're further ahead in that vaccination program as, as, as ahmed has indicated um so they're now doing booster doses so we will probably have to have another dose next year as a booster dose every year to keep up with our with our vaccination but all of that is in an environment where we can go out and we can go to the football again and we can go and socialize again and we can have all of our families at home again and we can do all the things we want to do um that's what living with corona i think looks like you know next year we can have a better life between now and then if we get rid of the cases we have in the community today and we don't see an, what i don't want to see is an is escalation like in sydney that we're running after tens and then hundreds and then thousands of cases every day, because then we all stay in lockdown and it's just horrible. Um, that's why I want to get the cases down 
now so we can open up and at least get some of the benefits of, of, of a freer life and then really look forward to 2022. Thanks, uh, for today. Thanks, Jerome. Just being conscious of time, we have hundreds of people, of attendees and so many questions. Yeah. But I've been building this one and getting to this, and there's a lot of questions about this, and I've saved it for the person that I think out of all the audience here has probably been dealing with it on a daily basis, you know, uh, from young men and young women, and it's about mental health and mental well-being. And Abu Hamza has been uh, on videos, He's been dealing with it and he sees it every day. Abu Hamza, we've saved this, which a lot of the questions have come through about it. Tell us what you're seeing and what advice you can give around mental health and well-being during these lockdowns. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. All praise due to Allah, we praise him, we seek his help and we seek his forgiveness. Well, first of all, I'm privileged to be amongst my uh, beloved brothers and respected sisters, respected um, Jerome, how you been? Hopefully you're doing well. Can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. That's okay. All right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we uh, I think our community is no different than the other communities. Uh, the devastation that has taken place with uh, mental health, uh, obviously depression, anxiety, uh, kids, kids obese, um, uh, divorce, uh, people indulging in drugs and alcohol more than any other time, gambling. Um, it's, it's just devastating out there. We do our utmost best to um, basically convey a clear message to the... Um, to our community to be patient with this lockdown. And, you know, we hope uh, that in the near future, this lockdown will be over so we can get back to normality. But it's very hard out there. Um, um, I believe that uh, this lockdown should end very quickly. Um, I believe, that's my own personal belief, even though that I convey a clear message to the, to the community to be um, tested. And we have, uh, we've been doing this for the last year and a half and we've uh, sent people to homes and they basically knocked on doors and uh, encouraged uh, mums and dads and kids to be tested. But I believe the devastation of this lockdown is much, much greater than at the moment, um, you, know, the, you know, the actual devastation that is taken up, whether it's mental health or others, it's greater than the lockdown itself. I really believe that the government needs to do something ASAP. I've listened to a doctor, and I'm not a person that listened to backyarders, a doctor that was on current affairs. He said we need to open up the schools ASAP, and we need to have greater ventilations, and yes, we need to implement uh, sanitizers and face masks and social distancing. But I'm seeing this. I'm actually in the middle of the community, the devastation of lockdown. I don't think that this issue that exists at the moment, you could ever repair it in 20, 30, 50 years. How can you explain to a kid three years old and five years old that he can't see it? You know, uh, allow me to say he can't go to a, a park and then play it, you know, in playground. How can you? It's it's just devastating. That's my opinion. And uh, please, I would appreciate that um, that message is uh, conveyed to the government. Um, mm -hmm. I would want this lockdown to end ASAP. That's, uh, yeah. again, my personal opinion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Abu Hamza. And that leads um, to a few questions from the audience. And I know, Jerome, you're not, but. Um you know, uh, a health and well-being expert, but it's clear this lockdown has really impacted uh, a lot of people. Yep. So I'm going to pick um, a, a couple of questions. Um, one of them is the problem with lockdown is that you feel alone, hardship, um, and I know so many other people, they pay lease, they've got rental office, they, they feel it's suffocated. Can the government, um, the Victorian government, be kinder around our mental health? Um, we need financial help and ease of mind. Yep. Yep. Is there any I've, I've, work being developed around that? Yeah, look, 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 there is, and I think I, I just want to just recognise that you know the very the very honest and wise words of, of Abu Hamza, and I, I absolutely, absolutely understand the hardships of lockdown that, that that all of our families and our communities face. And I think, and Mustafa, as you said at the beginning, um, some some families, larger families, people living households across different houses, feel that much more than than others. Absolutely, yeah, no, no one's ignoring that. Um, there is a lot of a lot of energy being thrown by not just by me but by other people in 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 different roles in government around financial support i mean financial support to get tested you know 450 dollars if you need to get a test you can and and miss work for a day you can get a 450 dollar payment if you need to isolate for 14 days you can get a 1500 dollar payment to help you isolate as, as part of the quarantine program and there's other financial support available for people running businesses i mean it's, it's incredible if you're running a small business now this is a devastating time and there's 
various funding sources available from from the, the state government and, and the federal government. Um, but but none of that, yeah, and, and I think you know, none of that removes the damage that we're seeing to our how to our communities, to our to our mental health, and to our people. The the problem is, and the genuine problem we have, and that the that the public health team, the chief health officer and his team have, is that the alternative is the, the alternative is almost the same as being the, the alternative is lockdown plus hundreds of people in hospital and tens of people dying. That's the alternative, and 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 we only need to look at Sydney to see it's a very similar environment. You're in lockdown, all those bad things are happening, but people are dying as well. And that's the consequence of the virus continuing to circulate. Um, we, you know, nobody in the world has found an alternative plan apart from keeping us from doing what we want to do most, which is seeing other people because we're social animals and social creatures. The only other solution, there's only, there's only two other solutions to lockdown. One of which is to accept that thousands, hundreds and thousands of us will die. And we've seen that all around the world. We've seen it in, in the North, in Europe, in, in, in the US, in India, in South America, where governments have said to different degrees, let's just let it go. And thousands, hundreds of thousands have died. And we've seen those horrific scenes. Um, the other option is to get vaccinated. And, and, and that's the only way out of this, because that way people stay alive and they can be, be protected from the from the virus in the future. Until we get vaccinated, lockdown is the only way to deal with it when it's in a community. The amazing thing in Australia has been, the lucky thing we've had in Australia is that by and large, we've kept the virus away out of the community. And the quicker we can get it out of the community now, here, right now, the quicker we can open up and see each other again and open coffee shops again and open playgrounds again. But if we opened coffee shops and playgrounds and went to each other's houses again now, and, and we, you know, we, we uh, Ahmed referred to it earlier, then the cases today wouldn't be 45, they would be hundreds. If, if we said tomorrow, open the playgrounds, open the coffee shops, and you can go and see your mum and dad, there would be hundreds and thousands of cases every day, and our hospitals would be full. And, and that is a dilemma that we have. And that is why the only thing I can encourage us to do is to stop it here and stop it now, and, and get these and, and that will get us down to zero and that allows us to open up in, in a matter of weeks rather than waiting until next year. Thanks Jerome, thanks uh, Abu Hamza. It is a uh, serious topic and a serious concern um, and majority of the questions coming back, you know, um, and it's not just about children, it's also um, about the parents, um, you know, as they say in an aeroplane, you know, put the mask on yourself to be able to look after your children so um you know there are support hotlines out there if you are feeling in distress i must say this um you know please uh, call these support services um most of them on all our ima facebooks and social medias as well as uh, other um, organizations um bash has been sitting there waiting patiently i think he's starting to learn that getting into retirement he's got plenty of time now up his sleeve but um Bash, I'm going to come to you. Um, you've been a big advocate, um, having a personal story with COVID with your mother. Um, and then most recently, obviously, you know, being raised and, uh, you know, in the West and a lot of friends in the North um, and being part of that community means a lot to you that you've put out a couple of messages urging the youth and the young guys and, and women to, to get tested, to isolate. What's your message out there? Assalamu alaikum everyone and uh, thanks for having me on uh, amongst the, uh, call them the big players of the community to be quite honest. I feel uh, in such a position where I've got no right to, to talk, uh, particularly my expertise, it's got nothing to do with um, this whole thing. But what, what I can say and I'll continue to say is the fact that, uh, and the, 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 the continuous message is about obviously doing the right thing, uh, the simple, clean, uh, pure message is uh, if you're sick, if you've got any forms of symptoms, do the right thing. And, uh, you know, obviously it's corona now, but if you, if you think about a typical flu or gastro, whatever it may be, the right thing is to simply stay away from people. Now, obviously back then there's no real getting tested, but um, the actual testing thing out there, it's, it's not painful. I think what it is is that it's probably some sort of pride within us that no, I'm not going to get tested. Who do they think they are? 
just go get the test if you're feeling some sort of symptoms. Do the right thing. Isolate. It's probably no different to any having any other virus or, or a gastro. Uh, that you you simply the best thing to do is to, is to stay away from people. Um, and that's the that's the answer right there. If we, if we want the case to drop um, right away, you know it's going to uh, we, we've got to just get tested, do the right right thing, isolate until we get that negative result, and just be cautious. Um, you know, I'm not going to be here right here to, tell, to say tell everyone to, to, to get vaccinated because personally, I haven't done my my uh, utmost research about it. You know, we've got experts that can give us the evidence right there. But what I would support everyone out there to do and uh, recommend is to get tested if you're feeling some sort of symptoms, uh, and to think about others other than yourself. Uh, you might not personally be affected to an extent by it, but your loved ones around you would you uh, would be, whether it's kids, whether it's your mother or father. So we just got to think about those around us and not just think about us. You know, we're probably we probably think that we're super healthy and we can get through this uh, being at, at a certain age, but we just got to really think about externally about those who who have got health conditions. Um, so we just got to uh, knuckle in. As we, as we say it in, in the footy, footy terms, and uh, it's just continuously doing our bit over the next two to three weeks, and we, we can definitely see results. So, and that's getting out of lockdown, which we all want to get out of lockdown and get back to normality. Um, so, yeah, just I continue to play uh, first and foremost a reminder for myself and those around me and the, 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 the greater community to just keep doing the right thing so we can get, get out of this. Thanks, Basha. And you mentioned many times for those right now, I think the key message is we've got to get tested, right? Especially if you're, you know, most of the exposure sites out in the West and North, you've, you've taken being a footy player, how many tests and tell us the experience of it for the people out there that haven't done it and are worried about it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done it probably almost a hundred times to be quite honest. Last year, post the season, it was 52 times. Um, and uh, yeah, to, to be honest, it's not painful. It's, it tickles a little bit. But to be be very honest, uh, for what you're going to go through within uh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds to a minute, is going to do the community uh, so much good. So it doesn't hurt at all. I mean, my kids have done it more than probably a lot of the majority of the people in the community because they have to because obviously my my time as an AFL player that my my family has to get tested. But if they can get through it, being four and seven. And I'm sure we as adults, as uh, teenagers, can get through it. So it's not difficult. Let's continuously do the right thing by getting tested. And, uh, yeah, just isolate, isolate if we've got any forms of symptoms and, and not think about ourselves alone. Think about those around us. And that's what Islam teaches us. Islam teaches us to love for your brother what you love for yourself. And that hadith, that saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is applicable to what we're, you know, uh, pleading with, with, with getting tested and doing the right thing. So... Let's not be selfish and think about self, ourselves, but think about those around us, inshallah. Inshallah, thank you. Before I uh, wrap it up, there's one more question that we get constantly asked, but I'm going to answer another one very quickly. Jerome, you got a message from Erwin from ABC News, who's uh, on tonight, and he belongs yeah. to the Indonesian Muslim community in Melbourne. Many of them can't access news to no exposure sites. Can you please put exposure sites on the Services Victoria app, if you can pass that on? I'll take that on board. We'll, we'll do what we can. Thank you. Thank you. We always got to please the journalists. Um, so take care of that. Now, Dr. Haloum, I don't know if you're in the capacity to answer this question. Can you explain the difference between mRNA, I'm assuming the Pfizer vaccination versus AstraZeneca? Can you give just a brief, what is the differences um, and how do they serve the purposes of COVID before we come up with a final conclusion and give Jerome a whole bunch of feedback to take back to his friends. Sorry, was that uh, in terms of how the vaccines work from a yes. mechanistic point of view? Yeah, so the Pfizer vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. So what that means is um, you're injected with an mRNA, which is, so the coronavirus has what we call a genome that's made of RNA, whereas people, for example, we have DNA, um, but we also have RNA but the virus only has the RNA. So what they do is they take a short segment of RNA um, from the virus, inject that into our body, and our body recognizes that RNA, um, and then it uses the RNA to make the protein, um, which is part of the virus. So when we're infected with a virus, that's how the infection happens. Our body takes the RNA of the virus, turns it into the protein, and then we become sick, and that's how the virus replicates in our body. 
So that's how the Pfizer vaccine works. Um, and the AstraZeneca vaccine is a DNA-based vaccine. So instead of having um, the RNA that is injected into the body, they've kind of converted that into a DNA version injected into the body. And then the same thing happens where basically the um, body will convert that into a protein that our immune system can recognize and get ready so that when it does see the actual coronavirus, it recognizes um, that protein and can have a really quick and swift immune reaction against the coronavirus. Uh, was that all? Was there another part of that question? Or? No, I think that's uh, pretty straightforward. And and both uh, do the same job, I guess, in tackling both COVID. vaccines. Yeah, are very effective. Uh, Pfizer might be slightly more effective, um, although it might so you might have more of a short term effect. So you might need more of a booster with the Pfizer. But from what we can see, both vaccines are very effective, especially at reducing um, severe illness. Okay, excellent. Um, so many questions. I'm very sorry we can't get to all of them. I have taken note that the next panel session you want, um, I know the Muslim Medical uh, Association, Ash, Shahata and, and team are online. Um, I think we're going to have to do another session with you guys um, and bring you on and get into a bit more in-depth you know, maybe it could be Mythbusters or something um, session. But um, I'm going to summarize some of the notes I've had uh, before, Jerome. I'll give you a few words before we close the session. And they are, go tell whoever you need to tell to increase the supply line of vaccinations because we want to get vaccinated, but there's not enough supply. Um, can we get more vaccination sites around communities? Um, and a couple of suggestions came around local mosques. Even though they're closed, it'll be easier for them to have some nurses, professionally trained people to get them vaccinated. Mental well-being, Abu Hamza drummed it, told you the way it is. A lot of questions come around it. What can we do around mental well-being? If we can't get out of the lockdown, um, what can we do to support it? Can you take that? It's a serious issue um, around the community and many communities. Um, that's around mental well-being. And then finally, I think the message uh, you are sending for us to get out of lockdown quickly before we get to the 80% in November is we all need to get tested and isolate. So we're making sure we're not carrying COVID to pass on our friends, our loved ones and our community as a whole. Um, I've got that message. I'm gonna quickly uh, pass it back to you. If you can give us a summary of everything you've heard and your, your conclusion before we call it a night, um, over to you, Jerome. Right. Thank, thank you, Mustafa and Alago. It's been it's been a it's been a fantastic discussion, and thank you so much for the for the feedback and the wise advice from from the rest of the panel and the good questions. Um, I, I, look, I think let me let me summarise what I, what I'm saying. Um, we can get out of this lockdown together in the next few weeks, and and we have to do what Basha has said and what others have said. Um, we just have to work together, think of ourselves, but also the people we love and get tested if we've got symptoms and isolate away from other people. If we do that for the next two or three weeks, we can hold this, we can stop this transmission we're seeing now. We can get rid of that transmission and we can open up and free up a bit and do the important things we want to get back to, including the critical things about getting our kids back in school. But we can't do that if we keep going into coffee shops, if we keep connecting with, our, with, with, with other households, we will see the numbers go up and we will be in this horrible place for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. So the main thing is, so just, just let's get through the next few weeks together and get rid of this lockdown. The other message is get vaccinated and absolutely take on board the point to make, make more vaccines available. We're on the case right now and there'll be more about that in the, in the days ahead. And thank you. Um, if there's anything more uh, we can do, the government can do to support this, then we will absolutely do it. Please only ask. Um, Thank you, Jerome. The community leaders, um, I think your message is loud and clear as, as we've summarised to the community. Um, guys, let's do it. We're in the final leg. Let's just push this. Let's stay isolated. Let's get tested. Let's make I want to thank all the panellists. Dr. Haloum, we took a lot of your time being the medical expert tonight. Thank you so much. I think you answered a lot of questions. Um, we're going to definitely have you back with um, a few other doctors and we can uh, have a, a separate discussion around vaccine and the different types to take. Um, Abu Hamza around mental health. Thank you so much, Brother Tariq, uh, Basha, Ahmed, Mohammed, Khotulina. Really appreciate it. Have a good night. Everyone, please stay safe. Look after yourselves. 
stay isolated. May Allah protect you and your families and get us all out as a community. Well, Mustafa, one more thing. Mustafa, one more thing. Can I add? Uh, I think it's a great idea in having like even test stations and vaccination in place sat mosques. Because, uh, you know, what I find also in our community is they're a lot more comfortable um, when they attend the mosque. Or, you know, they attend the place where, where there is, you know, uh, Lebanese people, all Muslim people uh, that are there. And uh, we found that out when uh, we had that we ran the last testing last time at the mosque, where a lot of the sisters were more comfortable to come to the mosque than what they were going somewhere else to get tested. I'm, I'm so sure Jerome can help you with that, uh, Tariq. I think that's Employ a great idea. Employ it's no different to employers. You know, people can do it at work sites. There's no reason why we can't see it as a work site. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I, I suspect after this, why don't you get in touch with Mustafa and uh, Jerome and uh, see Absolutely. what we'll Absolutely. Good to see you all very much and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Well, uh, have a good night. Look after yourself. Good night. So, Thank you, guys.